Welcome, I'm your host, Amaya Gasway from Big Babylon Senior High School BB Productions. It's a pleasure to host you. I hope everyone is staying at home, washing their hands, and being safe during this pandemic. The Washington Teaching Union has launched a major initiative called Learning Doesn't Stop Lesson on TV. Let's first check out Rachel Thomas from Bunker Hill Elementary School, followed by Mr. Cappuccino from Lafayette Elementary School. Let's see what we can learn today. Hi, this is Mrs. Thomas. Welcome back to a wonderful Wednesday. I'm a fourth and fifth grade ELA teacher at Bunker Hill Elementary. And today we're gonna to be talking about text structure. Text structure is the way that the author organizes the information in a text. It's important to understand the way that they organize it so you can better comprehend the content. Before we get started, I wanna give a huge shout out to the class of 2020. I know this is not the most ideal situation for this time of your life where you should be celebrated and able to experience all the achievements that you've made over the last four years of high school. But I also want to say to my eighth graders that were my first promotion class, you are going to be stepping into the next stage of your life and I am so excited and proud of you. So congratulations and hats off to the class of 2020. You were loved and you were celebrated. Before we get started, make sure you have your notebook and a pencil because there is going to be some definitions that you want to write down and also some graphic organizers that you may want to recreate to help support your understanding. So, nonfiction text structure, description, sequence and order, cause and effect, problem and solution. Each of these has their own keywords that signal to the reader what type of text structure you are reading. Let's dig a little deeper and find out what they are. Description. A topic, idea, person, place, or thing is described by listing its features, characteristics, or examples. I'd also suggest that you pay attention to the text features that may be there with description text. Here are some keywords to better help you understand a description text. Now, what I notice about these words is that they can be describing an object, giving a location of something, or explaining a situation. Now let's practice. Is the following an example of the descriptive text structure? While the Aztecs and the Mayans were both Native American tribes in Florida, there are many differences between the two tribes. The Mayans were very scientific, setting stars and trying to measure time. However, the Aztecs were more warlike people who would wage war against their neighboring tribes. Is that descriptive text? Well, if you said that is a non-example, you are right. The words that I focused on were differences. So that shows me that this is a compare and contrast text structure. Good job. Let's try another one. Let's try it again. One. Ponce de Leon led many expeditions to the New World. For example, he led the first European expedition to Florida, leaving on March 4, 1513. Is that an example of descriptive text structure? If you said that is an example, you're correct, because it says, for example, it's describing his first expedition. Great job. Let's continue. Now for the graphic organizer. Get your pencil and paper ready because you may wanna write this down to better help you with description text. So you can draw circles or squares, you can draw as many as you need, but I only did four to help me brainstorm a description for a kiwi. So that's gonna be my topic, the fruit kiwi. I put my topic in the center and then I begin building the description around it. I'm also gonna make sure that I use and reference my keywords when I write out my paragraph. So a kiwi is fuzzy. It can be sweet and tart sometimes. It can be firm in texture. And of course, they're healthy for you. Now, let's get into sequence and order. Again, a definition that you can write down to help you remember better what sequence and order looks like. This describes events in order or explains the steps one must follow to do something or make something. Have you ever taken out a toy and you had to build parts of it? You need to go in order, you had to follow the directions. 
Or if you've ever baked a cake, you know you have to go in order and follow the directions. So this is what a text structure looks like. For These are the keywords that you can follow to help you understand a sequence and order text structure. Now let's practice. Is the following an example of the sequential text structure? The 13 colonies did not like being under British control when they did not have a say in Parliament. Eventually, the 13 colonies went to war in the American Revolution to fight for their independence. When they won, the 13 colonies got to have their own government and were no longer suppressed by the British. What do you think? Is that an example or non-example? Well, if you said a non-example, you were right. Is the following an example of the sequential text structure? In order to make a peanut butter sandwich, first you need to take out two pieces of bread. Next, you need to get the peanut butter and a knife. Then you spread the peanut butter on both slices of bread. After that, put the two pieces of bread together. Finally, enjoy the delicious sandwich. Is that an example or not example? Great job. If you set an example, you're right because the keywords are listing each specific step. The first passage didn't do that. It gave the general um, events that occurred when America was being founded, but it did not list it in sequential order. Now for your sequence and order graphic organizer. You wanna start with your first step. If you're gonna organize your information correctly, you wanna make sure you do it in order. So you have your first step, your second step, your third, and your fourth. Depending on the text that you're reading, you may have to create more boxes or another form of this graphic organizer that just shows a sequence of ideas. You can do this in many different forms, but boxes just tend to be easier. All right, now we're at compare and contrast. The text that we read before, the example, that was more of a compare and contrast text because it showed the differences between the two groups of people. So we know that it shows how things are alike and how things are different. Some of the key words for compare and contrast are as follows. Let's read the following to see if this is a compare and contrast text structure. The legislative, executive, and judicial branches are all parts of the government. While they are par all parts of the government, their roles are very different. The executive branch is run by the president who can approve or veto bills. The legislative branch includes the Senate and House of Representatives who writes the bills to be made into laws. The judicial branch includes the Supreme Court who rules whether laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. Is that an example of compare and contrast? If you said yes, then you are correct. Good job. Let's look at another text structure of compare and contrast. The 13 colonies were not prepared to fight a war with Great Britain, a strong powerhouse with many resources that the 13 colonies did not have. Due to not being prepared, the 13 colonies faced many brutal battles during the American Revolution, including times when they ran out of bullets. Was that a compare and contrast text structure? If you said that was a not example, you're correct. You're getting better at this already. Now, this may be one that you're very familiar with from school is a Venn diagram. This is a way to compare and contrast your information where you show the differences on the outside. And then as you see the overlap of the circle, that is where you can write your similarities. Of course, you can write it to scale to fit the information as follows. All right, cause and effect. This shows a relationship between cause, the events, and effect, what happened because of the event. Now, these are the keywords that will support you understanding a cause and effect relationship. Let's read this to determine whether or not this is a cause and effect text structure. The Spanish-American War was between Spain and the United States. 
Spain sought compromise to the problems in Cuba, but the United States refused. The Spanish-American War was a 10-week war fought in both the Caribbean and the Pacific, ending in the 1898 Treaty of Paris. Hmm, is this an example of cause and effect text structure? If you said this was a non-example, you were right. Let's try another one to see if this can be a cause and effect text structure. The Spanish-American War was called a splendid little war by John Hay, the U.S. ambassador to London. The cost of the war was very high, though with 385 soldiers killed in the war and another 5,000 dying of tropical mosquito-borne disease. Is this an example of cause and effect text structure? If you said yes, you are right. The cause here is the war, and the effect was, of course, the soldiers dying, but also that they got infected by the mosquitoes in the tropics. And here's the cause and effect graphic organizer. Again, you can use any shape you want, but if you have your pencil and paper ready, go ahead and draw the cause and effect graphic organizer. You place your cause in one box, and then you can place the effects in multiple boxes following. You can connect them with arrows as needed. So far, you guys are doing a great job. This one, problem and solution, is what nonfiction text typically is. It tells a problem and it gives one or more of the solutions. These are the key words or signal words that let you know that it is a problem and solution text structure. Now, let's practice. Is this an example of the problem and solution text structure? When creating a political or physical map, there are many necessary elements to include. These elements are a title, compass rows, and a legend or a key. A or B, is this an example or a non-example? If you chose a non-example, you are right on the money. Let's try another one to see if we can find the problem and solution text structure. The 13 colonies were very unprepared for the American Revolution. They did not have their own armed forces, uniforms, weapons, or training. To help fix these issues, the 13 colonies received help and supplies from other countries, including formal military training from Frederick von Steuben, a German soldier. Is that an example or not example? If you said example, you are right on the money. The phrase that helped me determine that this was an example of problem and solution text structure, it says to help fix these issues. There was a problem of being unprepared, and then they showed how they got better prepared for the American Revolution. This is my problem and solution graphic organizer. Go ahead and take time to draw it out. You have here the problem in the big box, and then I created four solutions because the definition said it may provide one solution to the text or more. You always wanna make sure that you are prepared for the text structure as well as the actual content in the text. Thank you for joining me again on this Wednesday for another rich discussion on text structures. I hope this better supports your understanding of the nonfiction text that you're reading in the fourth and fifth grade. And of course, if you need further resources or information, please visit wculocal6.net because the learning doesn't stop. Hey, good morning, everybody. Once again, this is Mr. Catapano from Lafayette Elementary School. And today I'm going to teach you a fifth grade lesson on plotting points on a coordinate plane and on a number line. So let's take a look at how we do that. I'll give you some examples, um, some problems to work on. Uh, we're going to be looking at some problems from module six, lesson two and three. So if you have your Eureka math book available, you can look uh, follow along with some of those concepts. Otherwise, all you need is the presentation that I'm going to present to you here this morning and we're going to take a look at those problems and make some definitions um, understand some concepts and we'll do some work together all right off we go guys today's lesson again as i said is about coordinate systems on both a plane and a number line um, once again i'd like to give a special shout out to my good friend and colleague mr david gregel uh, who helped me put together this powerpoint presentation thank you mr gregel and let's take a look at some of our concepts for today so, 
Coordinate systems on a plane. Here are some examples of where you might think about a coordinate system on a plane. Right? You'll notice in all of these examples, the plane itself, which is the main part of the map here, the bingo board, the chessboard, right, um, have both uh, measurements on the top and the sides, right? Um, you'll see that here in this, this map, uh, you have coordinates that are A through J and then 1 through 10. Uh, for the bingo board, something similar, right? You have these letters at the top. For a uh, chessboard, you again have coordinates at the top and the sides and the bottom. So here we see our labeling of X and Y axes. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and then here we have a coordinate plane, right? Where our Y axis is moving up and down and our X axis is moving left to right. So looking at a coordinate system on a plane. So here's our plane, right? This flat surface here. Um, and we have two sets of measurements here. We have measurements on an x-axis, which again runs left to right. So again, you have this example here. So if I move my red arrow line here, we'd say, okay, this is my x-axis. Everything that runs from zero to six and then zero to negative six. We also have something what we call our y-axis, which is arrows that move straight up and down. So again, we have arrow, an arrow uh, measurement here that goes from a zero, which is our origin. We're gonna talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that concept in just a moment. But we're gonna start with our origin here and we can move up the number line one through six or down the number line, negative one through negative six. Um, so keeping that in mind that when we look at a coordinate on this plane, we have to measure both the X measurement, the X axis measurement, and the Y axis measurement. Now coordinate systems on a line is all about a number line. So here are some examples of where you might see a line. Uh, this might look familiar to you here. This is the red line. And uh, we use this example because uh, Lafayette is right off the red line on you know, Friendship Heights. Um, but this is our red line and you see each of the points fits somewhere along the line. Same thing here with like a thermometer or a tire pressure gauge. Uh, football field runs in a linear fashion here, right? And so this is all about the number line. So again, we have both plane systems, right? Where you have an X and Y axis. And then we also have a number line system or a line system where it's just points on a line. Okay, so looking here, we have a number line system, right? So we wanna find the missing numbers on this number line. So we're gonna identify points for A, B, and C. So let's start by taking a look at what this number line is all about. For this number line, I'll get a bigger pointer here. For this number line, we have to notice where our origin is. So again, this is our origin of our number line, right? Zero. Origin. Right? And because this is our origin, we know that each point ahead is gonna go up in a positive direction. Uh, mainly because we have a number here of positive 10. So every, we, what we're gonna find here is that everything in between here has to be a value between zero and 10. So let's look at how many marks we have between zero and 10. Can you count them along with me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So there are 10 marks from zero to 10, which means that each one of these marks has to be what? That's right, it has to be a whole number, right? Um, because from zero to 10, if there are 10 of them, then that is one whole number for each hash mark. So that means that if we're gonna label these numbers, my first hash mark will be one, then two, then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10. And now all we need to do is just look at the corresponding letters. So letter B is gonna give us a measurement of two. Letter C is five. And letter A is going to be nine. All right, so all we have to do is find the corresponding letter to the corresponding number to find the missing number on the number line. 
So let's look at some of these number lines and see what, how are they the same and how are they different. If we took each of these number lines as an example, right? Here's one, here's another one here, another one here, another one here, and another here. How are these the same? You might say that they all have the origin of zero on their number line. Yep. That these two number lines have whole number markings while these three have uh, fractional or decimal parts. Uh huh. Notice that these four or these three are fully numbered while these two are not. Notice how some are going vertically up and down, some are going horizontally side to side, and some are going in a diagonal fashion, right? Does that matter really? Not really, as long as you know where the origin is and you have at least one measurement on the number line, okay? So now thinking about uh, some vocabulary, again the origin is where the zero is on the number line, so that would be right here. Zero is the origin, and then the coordinate tells you the distance from zero to the location on the number line. So the, these are the coordinates here, right? These numbers and the symbols are coordinates on the number line. So this tells you the distance from zero to the location on the number line. I have a word problem that focuses on a number line. Uh, and finding the coordinates on this number line. So here we have, we have a landscaper is planting some marigolds, which are a type of flower, um, in a row. The rows are two yards long. You'll see that here. Here's our row. And flowers must be spaced one third apart so that they will have proper room to grow. The landscaper plants the first flower at zero. Okay. Uh, place points on the number line to show where the landscaper should have should place the other flowers. And then the question is, how many marigolds will fit in this row? So let's take our pen here. And let's make a little symbol here for our marigold. Okay, there's one. So we know that there's one at zero, right? What we know is that it's two yards long, and the flowers must be spaced one third apart. So what we need to also do is, 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 is what we did earlier with our number line, which is to figure out what's how many hash marks are there in between zero and one. And that way we can figure out by, uh, we can figure out then what each is worth. So how many do we have here? Count them with me, will you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So this is one yard. I'm going to make my pen a little bit smaller so it's a little easier to see here. But this will be eighteen eighteenths. So we know that each yard is split up into eighteenths, right? So which means that this is one eighteenth, two eighteenths, and so on, right? Now, we have to remember that the flowers must be placed one third apart, right? This is really one third yard apart, so this is really important information. What we probably should figure out here is, okay, well, one third is equal to how many eighteenths, right? Because we're trying to figure out how many, or where we can plant these flowers, but it's broken down into eighteenths. So what's our equivalent fraction here between one third and eighteen? That's right, there's six eighteenths and a third. So that means every six eighteenths will plant a marigold. Okay, so let's do that together here, right? Let me get my pointer again, a little bit bigger. So every six eighteenths, so this is two, three, four, five, six. There's one. Okay, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's another. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's one at the yard. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, five. Oops, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So what we have here is at every point, at every six eighteenths, we have a marigold. So here's another one. So let's count them up. One, two, three. There's another one here at one yard. Four, five, six, and seven. So, how many do we have all together, including the one that we planted here? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So, the question is how many marigolds will fit in this row? Seven. Seven will fit in the row. I want to show you here today because we're running a little low on time. 
um, is to show you how to plot lines or how to identify plotted points on a coordinate plane. So again, we have our x-axis that runs left to right and our y-axis that runs up and down. What you're going to think about is that when you give a coordinate or you are um, asked to identify the point using coordinates, that it is the x-axis that always comes first. So this is our sort of run uh, coordinate here, and then our jump coordinate is our y-axis. So we'll run first and then jump. So the first coordinate that I'm looking at is x-coordinate 2, y-coordinate 5. So I look at 2, I run across to 2, and then I jump 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I thought wind up here with the triangle. So the triangle here is our shape at 2, 5. All right? And then what is it at 1, 2? Well, here's 1, run 1, jump 2. That's our circle. Can you identify which shape is at coordinate 6, 5, 6, excuse me? Here is 5, and then jump 6. That's right, the square. And then can you identify coordinate 6, 5? 6, over run 6, jump 5. That is our hexagon. Octagon, excuse me. Hard to, hard to draw, but you get the idea. All right. All right, everybody, so that was my lesson on showing you how to plot coordinates on both a number line and on a coordinate plane. Um, there are more examples of problems to work on in this PowerPoint. I, didn't, I wasn't able to get through all of it today, but it is up on the WTU website, which is at wtulocal6.net. So please check out my PowerPoint there. And again, additionally, if you want more practice, um, I took some examples from uh, the Eureka Math uh, less, uh, Module 6, Lessons 2, 3, and I believe 4 as well, um, all focus on those same concepts. Um, so please make sure you take a look at that for some extra problems and extra work to do. Um, and be looking at where you can maybe identify other coordinate planes that you see um, on TV or that you see in the newspaper or you see online. Uh, perhaps you see one behind me on this big antique map of downtown DC. Maybe you could identify some coordinate planes on there. So there are lots of places to find those. Um, take your time to find them and then also just do more practice work with our coordinate planes. So thank you guys so much for a wonderful morning and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye now.